You know a saying that we should remember? Choose your heroes wisely. Well, in the case of the modern left, perhaps it's their heroes that tell us where modern intersectional woke ideas really come from. I think Jordan Peterson did exactly that, revealing how postmodern thinker Michael Foucault's questionable personal life ties into the ideology that he birthed. You've criticized the postmodernists, and you, you, you do it often. And you, um, yeah. and for, but also gave the devil his due. You know, the sure. postmodernists were definitely on to something. They, they also knew that we see the world through a story. Mm -hmm. That's, they just got the story wrong. Just. just. <laughs> but, 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 they, but it's really something to, to have noticed. And, and the French intellectuals like, like Foucault, who is brilliant, although twisted, and bent in a terrible way, but brilliant. I mean, Foucault was one of the first people to really put his finger on this. And, and his, his book, uh, uh, The Order of Things, the first half of that book is brilliant. It, it deteriorates as it goes. He, it needed to be edited more near the end. What well, did you find so brilliant about it? His grappling with the notion of the structure of our conceptual structures, right? He knew that we, we saw the world through a structure. And he had an intimation that it was narrative in nature. And he lays that out by analyzing older structures of knowledge, uh, in a sense, from the perspective of an anthropologist or a psychologist. He does very much what Jung did with his work on alchemy. It's very similar, except Jung derived almost completely opposite conclusions to Foucault. And Foucault. Foucault had his problems, let's put it that way, and they definitely tilted his thinking in a counterproductive way. Are you direction. referring to his sexual deviance? Or? Yes, and not only, it, it isn't only that. It, so he was, he was gay. And, but That's that, not what I was referring to as a yeah, sexual deviance, yeah, by the yeah, way. I know, I know, good work, that will make you popular. <laughs> deviant does mean different from the norm. Right. You no, know, so, so, um, Technically, that's true. Devi to devi it means to deviate from the path in some sense, right? But I mean, Foucault was also a little bit more interested in, let's say, young people than, mm -hmm. you know, he might have been. Which is what I was referring yeah. to. Yes, and, and, and in a manner that appears to be quite deeply pathological in, in, in a very, 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 very dark way. And, well... We won't say much more about that. The art is hard to separate from the artist, and I think something similar can be said about thinkers as well. Michael Foucault was arguably one of the few of his contemporaries to have birthed postmodern thought in the mid-20th century, but maybe there's a line we can draw from his actions to his thoughts? Here's why I say that. There's a misconception that humans think first and act later. I believe it's more often the opposite. We do what lures or compels us, and then we make up ideologies, justifications, and theories to make that make sense to ourselves. Now take this new lens on the relation between thought and behavior and look at the tenor and flavor of the intellectual movement he forwarded. Postmodernism deconstructs not just established ideas and power structures, but also questions society's moral certainties. It rips the floor from underneath your philosophical standing and leaves you hovering in the air of uncertainty. And you know what? When you're uncertain of what is true or false and right or wrong, it becomes a lot easier to justify your actions to yourself by making up rationales as you go along. When allegations of Michael Foucault's abuse of children in Tunisia surfaced back in 2021, it was certainly a shock to many people that identified with his thought. But in a twisted and demented fashion, perhaps it was that same thought that justified the most heinous actions to himself and his conscience. Perhaps that is also the pathway from Michael Foucault's deconstructionist thought and his infamous attacks on the age of consent laws in France. What's the one thing that perhaps describes postmodern thought above anything else? It's the inconsistence on understanding relations, ideas, and morals through the lens of power. It is hard to see, then, that Michael Foucault's contractual notion drew from the same power-driven worldview to question the idea that a child can't consent. Once you realize how even those two things connect, it explains everything that's wrong with modern woke culture. Earlier in this conversation, we talked about artists not being political or not letting... Uh, what the artist's opinion doesn't really matter on the art itself, the art should Even stand that. But does that not apply with Foucault to an extent where what he did in his private life uh, well, it does horrid to an as, extent. It, as it was? Oh, definitely. Well, that's why you actually 
hopefully you know it's, it's why because to live it is to right his actions actually speak more for his philosophy than his words well no at least his actions his philosophy there's a relation between his philosophy and his actions now what the relation is that's a very difficult thing to sort out and you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater you know when we look at people historical figures and this is happening all the time we look at someone great, Francis Galton would be a good example because he's been the target of progressive attacks for his hypothetical doctrines of racial superiority, which fundamentally means that people who are attacking Galton just never read him, and no one does. Although my student Daniel Higgins uh, wrote a thesis about Galton and did read him, and Galton was a very, Galton was an amazing person. He was a polymath, he's an utter genius. He made signal contributions to like a hundred disciplines. He was really something. But he was also a man of his time and place, and a lot of intellectual scholarship now consists of going back over someone's biography with a fine-tooth comb, finding some way they were in keeping with their times that doesn't match modern sensibility, and then saying, well, I don't have to read anything that person wrote. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, fair enough in some sense, but people do this with Freud all the time, too, because Freud was a Victorian, <clears throat> for better or worse. And not everything he said jives with modern sensibility. It's like, well, you don't have to read Freud, but then you don't get to read Freud. And Freud is 90% wheat and 10% chaff. And 10% is still quite a lot, but 90% wheat is pretty good. The typical book is 1% wheat and 99% chaff. You know, I often read books where there's there's not a single idea in the book, really. You know, it's it's it's... It's a shallow rehash of ideas that were well established in multiple ways uh, by many people. Well, the, and, the, but Freud's not like that. The interpretation of dreams is there's something brilliant on every page, and man, you can learn that, you know. And and maybe and same with Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche said some bitter things about women, for example, and so you can take those and you can say, well, who's going to listen to him? It's like, Fair enough, you know. Don't. But it's Nietzsche. So that's your loss, man, not his. He's dead. He doesn't care. But but the idea that... And it's the same with Foucault, you know. I mean, I'm not a fan of Foucault's private life. That's for sure. And I have some sense of a clinician of just how dark it was. And it was plenty dark. And did that affect his philosophy? Yes. I think it made him much more attracted by Marxist doctrines of power than he would have otherwise been. And some of that was definitely self-serving as far as I can tell. But The Order of Things is a great book. So you read and you differentiate and you discriminate just like you do when you're talking to someone and you try to separate the wheat from the chaff and gather the wheat and let the chaff fly away. You certainly can let the chaff fly away, but it's harder to do that when the thinker in question laid one of the foundational stones to some contentious ideas that carry forward to this day. Michael Foucault's sexual deviance, perhaps, shows us an extreme end of where deconstructionist relativism leads, but there's a plenty long road before you get there. The wave of postmodernism we saw after the mid-20th century in a variety of disciplines is what has led us, ultimately, to woke identity politics today. It eroded every uniting idea that held this country together for over two centuries. Like national pride, religious faith, and family unit, and our foundational ideas, it chipped away at everything and left people bereft in searching for something to replace the void that absence created. Isn't that basically what you see today as well? We're constructing racism into anti-racism, we've forgotten what the word woman means, and we're just flirting with ideas that would be anathema to people just a few decades ago. That deconstruction of language and relativism in morality perhaps carries over from Foucault's international mind all the way to our modern society because we're already seeing new terms invented for abusers of children, maps, or minor attracted persons is the new vocabulary, that they try and fail to chip away at our moral certainty against the morally reprehensible idea that it describes. That's what you end up with when every idea, moral, and principle is tossed up into the air and French intellectuals like Foucault and Derrida have a large role to play in that. But the question still remains, to what extent should we separate the thinker from his actions, and how much should we allow ourselves to learn from a character like him? I think the answer is simple. The best way to defeat ideas is with better ideas. And though you may vehemently disagree with Foucault or the consequences of his ideas, it's better to hear him out. 
It's better to allow him to speak to us from the past through his writings and give us a window into the mind he was, because after all, there's no way you can just wish away the postmodern ideologies that you see today. So it's better to try and understand their roots and see if you can predict where they will lead. That's how we can at least do justice to our own credentials of speech and free dialogue, even if it means including someone from the past into the conversation. Michael Foucault may have led a dark personal life, but he and his ideas are still a reality that need to be contended with. The way we do that is to understand those ideas deeply if you want to counter them. I think that's something even Jordan Peterson would agree with.